Bio 102, Lecture 4, The Immune System. Oh, students, good morning. You're in for a treat. Today we talk about how we have battles inside our bodies and how we are always successful. Well, most of the 99% of the time, we're always successful against these horrible invaders that are out to get us. And it's not paranoia. Um, the first thing you need to understand is that the body has a remarkable ability to distinguish between its own cells, which would be self-cells, and foreign cells, or non-self-cells. And this doesn't seem very intuitive, but it is very important to understand, because otherwise, how is the body to know that this cell belongs to me and that cell does not belong to me? It doesn't, I mean, there's, there are no eyes, there's nothing, nobody's wearing any dress or clothing that shows that this is uh, not me and this is me. So there are no distinguishing characteristics uh, as we would think of them. However, the body does have a remarkable ability to distinguish between its own cells and the cells that we are always are being showered with. Now, this is a very, very ancient and very conserved chemical pathway. So this has been around forever. And the reason we are able to do that is self cells actually carry marker molecules. They have these chemical molecules and which stick out like little flags and all of our body cells will have the same identical flag. So when we have this system that goes around checking, uh, is this you, is this me, is this me, is it me, is it me, is it me, it'll say yes, 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 yes. And then when it sees a different flag, it'll say, aha, this is not me. So when foreign cells invade the body, they carry non-self markers because they carry markers for their own selves. So every organism has its own markers. That's kind of unique. Um, it's like fingerprints. It's unique. Everyone has their own markers. Uh, everybody has cells and each cell of that person has that unique marker system. So when our body cells uh, re figure out that there is a different marker, um, it will immediately start an attack against uh, the f foreign cell. Any non-self substance that can trigger this immune response is called an antigen. So that's the definition of an antigen. Uh, it could be anything. The antigen can be a microbe, like a virus, or part of a microbe, such as a molecule of a virus, or tissue cells. Uh, tissues are cells from somebody else, um, except an identical twin. They also carry non-self markers and act as foreign antigens. So you should understand that unless it's an identical twin, which is a clone of you, um, they, every single person in this world will have different markers than you do. Uh, your mom, your dad, your sisters, siblings, even a fraternal twin, um, but not an identical. Identical twins are actually clones, so they're just like you. So they will have the same markers. Um, so every, every other person, every living organism will have a different marker and they will be recognized as non-self and uh, your body will mount an attack against anything that tries to invade it. Um, and so that is our system. And I would like you to look at uh, this link, uh, which I brought in for you because it is upbeat and lively and it actually goes through all the things that we're going to listen to and going to go over um, in the next few slides. So please take a look at it, uh, click on it and come back to me. Here are some pictures um, of what I mean by a marker of self. So uh, we all discussed very early on that we have four types of tissue cells. We have epithelial cells. Um, and if you look at the little markers, so every cell has many kinds of markers and they will all be in a certain way, in a certain position, and they all make you. Um, in our muscle cells, we'll have the same markers, see? Um, if you look, there are three purples, uh, one, two, three, uh, same as in the epithelial cell, a blue and a green. Um, and if you look at your nervous tissue cells, they also have the same markers and then also um, our connective tissue or our blood cells, which have the exact same markers. So all our cells are stamped exactly the same. However, bacteria or other organisms, they have their own markers. 
um, say ha they have distinctive markers. And um, so what we um, have are these um, cells that will look for these cells that are not ours. Uh, we have our own warriors that will look for foreign pathogens and they will look for markers that do not look like its own. And um, they will tag them and identify them. So for instance, this is our own cell, okay? Has the same markers as this nerve cell. So it checks it and says, yeah, you're fine. But when it looks at this SARS virus, it does not have the same markers. So it says, aha! And it will immediately um, uh, bind to it and neutralize the threat. So here's a bigger version of the same idea. Um, what we have are antigens. These are, would be the bad guys. And then we have antibodies. These are the actual chemical molecules that will um, neutralize the pathogen. So the yellow guys are all antigens or the bad guys. And these blue things that you see at the bottom these are actually uh, antibodies that our body produces um, that have very specific marker molecules um, that will fit into uh, the pathogen. Like for instance, this antigen has a rounded edge. So this particular antigen will fit right here. Um, this antigen has this kind of a marker molecule. So this one will fit right here, but not here and so on and so forth. So uh, we have antibodies which are very, very specific to the antigen that is being presented to us. Um, the immune system has to coexist peaceably with your own other body cells. And that is a state known as self-tolerance uh, because these um, fighter cells that we do possess, they are so eager to fight and they're such good warriors that they are out to kill everything. So they have to be trained. Um, yes, that's good to kill everything. Everything is good, except us, except us. So please don't kill my own cells. And so they have to be trained not to kill us, but to train, uh, but to kill everything else. So this is difficult. Um, do think about it. So if you have um, 100 beads in a bottle and every single bead is red, except one, which is white, well, um, you're told, go pick out the white bead. It's going to take you a very long time to get to that white bead, isn't it? Even if you're looking, if you're not looking, it doesn't matter. It will take you a lot of tries. And so you have to finally get there. And this is how our own markers, our own cells, the fighter cells, um, have to be trained. You have to be trained to go get that, um, the bad guys, all the bad guys, but don't kill our own cells. The, this set of unique markers on human cells is called, and there's a special name for it, it's called the Major Histocompatibility Complex, and usually we just uh, abbreviate it as MHC. So when you see MHC in the subsequent slides, um, do understand that I'm really referring to the Major Histocompatibility Complex, all right? And there are two classes of uh, the major histocompatibility complex. There's a class one proteins, which are on all cells. Um, so every cell will have that. And then there are uh, class two proteins, which are on only certain specialized cells. So let's take a look at all the organs of the immune system. Um, so where is our immune system? Uh, believe it or not, um, the bone marrow produces a lot of the immune cells. Our lymph nodes, you always know that. Um, the thymus uh, actually is a very old gland, and yes, we have immune system cells in there. The spleen produces some, um, and their lymph nodes and so on. And so you um, have generally known about, well, we talked about the lymph, lymphatic vessels and the lymph nodes, so um, you know most of this as already. There are two types of immune systems. The first line of defense of any organism is to preserve itself, itself by having an immune system. And there are two kinds of immunity. One is called innate and the other is called acquired or adaptive. So the innate immunity is present on all organisms. All living organisms have innate, all, okay? All have innate immune system. Um, they, what is the innate immune system? 
Again, it's chemistry. So uh, these would be receptor proteins that bind to form mo molecules, and this innate immune system is present everywhere. We may not c care that bacteria get sick or um, a bug gets sick or something gets sick. We don't care, really, but uh, they care, so they have to protect themselves from all the viruses and bacteria that are trying to infect them. And so they have an innate immune system. Um, they get rid of their uh, pathogens, too. However, uh, the higher forms of life have a second backup system, which is called the adaptive immunity. And that, the adaptive immunity is a backup system, and it is, so this is backup, all right, and it's the second system. Um, and this has a vast arsenal of receptors, which are very, very target specific. And it's only present in vertebrates, and it's much, much slower to develop. So these are for higher life forms. Um, so here we are. Um, let's look at this. this. This I took from your book. This is a summary of just, uh, just what we talked about. Uh, there are two types of immunity. One is the innate immunity that's present in all animals. Uh, what does it consist of? It's the recognition of traits, of generic traits shared by broad ranges of pathogens. And it's just got a small set of receptors. So um, this is generic. Okay, so this is a generic response. It's a, but it works very well because it's very rapid. And um, in the innate immunity, besides uh, the chemical stuff, we are, actually have physical barriers. So we have uh, physical barriers like the skin or the mucous membrane or secretions. Um, hair, we have all these barriers which are physical and not chemical, which will trap and get rid of a whole bunch of uh, invaders. Then if those do actually make it past those physical barriers, we have the chemical barriers and these would be those. And these are the internal defenses. We have cells. Um, these would be for all multicellular animals, of course. So this is multicellular. All right. Um, and uh, for unicellular, we, they would have um, a, a mucous membrane, um, secretions. They have a skin. Well, it's not really a skin. It's a plasma membrane. Um, they have, uh, if you're unicellular, then you would just have uh, these physical things. But then you do have antimicrobial proteins and a few other of the things that multicellular uh, organisms share. So there are phagocytic cells. And these are uh, phagocytes, which are white blood cells, and they go and engulf foreign invaders. Then we have natural killer cells, which are very specialized, and all they do is just kill. And we'll look at them in a minute. Um, and then we have antimicrobial proteins. This is a complement a set of proteins that floats around in your blood. It's always in the inactive form. And uh, when it bumps against an invader, it will get active and it will produce a sequence of responses. And then there's in the inflammatory response, which um, brings a lot of water in into the infected area. And so a lot of uh, these uh, white blood cells will come rushing in to uh, see what's the problem and kill the invader. So we do also have the adaptive immunity, and this is in higher animals, the vertebrates, um, where we have a very, very uh, specific recognition of particular pathogens because we have a vast array, almost infinite array of receptors uh, on very specialized cells. And um, but, but to know uh, that the adaptive immunity doesn't kick in right away, um, it kicks in after all this has failed. Now, after this has failed, this has failed, and this has failed, then only will the adaptive immunity kick in, and it therefore is slower um, to, to activate. Um, there are two ways to get to the adaptive immunity. There's a humoral response, where there are antibodies um, that defend against the infection um, in body fluids. Uh, so if the infection is in any fluid in our body, which is most of the time, then uh, we would secrete antibodies, which are chemicals. But there's a cell-mediated response, too, where if the cell's internal mechanism is infected, then uh, there has to be something else that has to be used. And um, they would have some other cells, uh, cytotoxic cells, which will defend against infection in the body. Let's look at all this one by one. 
Vertebrates have innate immu immunity as well as adaptive. All right, They're, they have epithelial cells which block the entry of pathogens like skin, mucous membranes, enzymes like lysozyme, which is in your eyes, your tears, secretions which raise the pH. All these things are, you know, immediate barrier defenses. Like uh, they will get rid of 90% of it, all the, the, the junk that's falling on us. Um, but vertebrates then also have an acquired immunity which gets activated once the pathogen enters the body and passes through all these barriers. And so the innate immunity, um, the adaptive immunity is not a learned response. Um, it is, I'm sorry, the innate immunity is not a learned response. The adaptive immunity is. The intensity of the innate response is the same because it has no memory. Um, it, it is the same as it, if it had never encountered that pathogen before. So what will happen is um, you may get some, some uh, pathogen and uh, the innate immunity will never remember that, oh, yes, I did this before, uh, and this is how I beat this. Um, it will just mount the entire defense. And we have external physical defenses like the exoskeleton and skin. Um, acidic environment would be well. Um, our sweat, uh, our, uh, uh, we, we secrete little acidic um, secretions and then there's also secretions like slime which is also acidic and then we have mucous membranes and we also have hair and cilia and these are all physical defenses most of the time. Um, I brought this out to show you uh, um, what innate uh, immunity is and uh, self versus non-self. So here is uh, kind of cute this would be you and this is a nasty thing or a bacteria or I mean, that's actually a virus um, and uh, so the most basic dis distinction between self and non-self is well you have uh, a nice membrane yeah skin um, which will keep out all these viruses and um, it will uh, not let it penetrate in um, however uh, if a virus does get in and then you get inflammation, um, you will have other things waiting for it to, to grab it. And so here is this, uh, it could be a virus, could be bacteria. So here is this bad guy coming in. Antimicrobial proteins will get activated um, and uh, some cells will just go and eat these. And, and uh, they will uh, send out signals to say, um, help us destroy this pathogen. So let's go over the simple stuff first. So innate immunity, it's very basic. It recognizes the exoskeleton. Um, exoskeleton can be made of chitin as an in insect, and chitin is a polysaccharide. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, you think of sugars as being, you know, just sugars, but they are actually there for uh, a barrier and can be a, a structural support system like chitin. So this would be uh, when you step on a bug and you hear the crunch, and that's chitin that you're crunching up. So defense is mounted against insect exoskeleton. So if you get a piece of the exoskeleton into you, um, your body will mount a defense. And this happens all the time because the air we breathe has a lot of suspended insect legs and things like that. So um, this, these go in. We take a breath, they go in. So a mount, uh, um, a defense is mounted right away. Um, it could be against a piece of the membrane of a bacteria or a fungus. Um, and so it would be against that little part of the membrane, which has lipids and sugars and amino acids. Um, so the innate immunity uh, is basic, generic, it responds to a bro broad range of pathogens. Um, so let's talk about um, simple forms of life, like bugs. In insects, the exoskeleton, which is made of chitin uh, and a polysaccharide, will form the first barrier to the pathogens. Remember, they have their skeleton on their outside. Uh, chitin lines both its outside as well as its intestines. So any pathogen breathing, breaching an insect's innate immunity. Um, so chitin, um, insects, because they're so small, they don't really need to uh, have a... Um, you know, a really big system of exoskeleton and separated out uh, uh, as an endos endoskeleton and then 
uh, barrier defenses, they just um, make it into one. Um, and so their exoskeleton actually lines their internal organs too, like its intestine. So anything that's actually able to get through those um, will be just eaten. It will be phagocytosed. Or antimicrobial peptides will be released to disrupt the membranes of the invaders because um, how do you kill an invader? You would break its membrane. Once the membrane is broken, then um, all the insides of that microbe are going to be released. And he has no um, a way of getting it all back and put it back together. So um, it, it just will uh, be no more. So you want to break apart that plasma membrane. The hematocytes of the insects will trap larger parasites like plasmodium because um, it, uh, it's not just little bugs that come. Uh, multicellular bugs can also um, get through the chitin of the uh, insects. So after detection, what happens? The pathogen is engulfed by a phagocyte. Um, how does that work? Well, there's a vacuole uh, that forms and it forms with the pathogen and it fuses with a lysosome, and the vacuole will either secrete the lysosome, which will break apart the pathogen's membrane, or the vacuole will secrete noxious gases to break apart the pathogen's membrane. So the phagocytes, there are many kinds of them. They, we generally talk of them as neutrophils or macro, macrophages. These are uh, white blood cells or cells that, are, that have feet and they're able to move. And these patrol the body or reside in tissues and just sitting there to, to eat and to engulf pathogens. There are other types of phagocytes. Um, there are two other types that called dendritic cells and eosinophils. Uh, um, these are the two important ones. The dendritic cells reside in tissues that have contact with the environment and they engulf pathogens too. Eosinophils, we're going to look at dendritic cells a little bit later too. Um, so just remember them. I think this is slide 17, so uh, when I tell you to go back, uh, please do come back here because we will talk about dendritic cells much, much later. Uh, there are also eosinophils, um, and these are for multicellular pathogens like worms. Um, so under, for instance, your own skin membrane, there are lots of little tiny worms, um, and they're um, in, entrapped by our eosinophils in little compartments, and they're boxed in so they can't get to the rest of our body cells and uh, wreak havoc. So uh, while they're trapped, um, there will be uh, lytic enzymes that will uh, go and uh, uh, break apart these worms' membranes so um, they can just get dissolved. Here are our warriors. These are the guys that are heroes, and they will they help us every single day, every minute of our life, um, and uh, help us against the foreign invaders that are constantly bombarding us. So here are the, the nice eosinophils for the worms, here are neutrophils, the dendritic cells, macrophages, and these killer cells are the ones that go around killing everything and have to be actually trained. Um, do not kill our own cells. Other innate defense for warriors. Um, so we just looked at the killer cells. Uh, killer cells patrol the entire body looking for surface abnormalities of cells, like cancerous cells or virus-infected cells. Um, and they're checking any bumps on the surface of any cell that is ours. And if they find one, they will secrete chemicals for necrosis, and they'll just zap that cell and kill it, um, our own cell because it's already compromised. Although most defense mechanisms are able to are to disrupt membranes, inhibiting reproduction of pathogens is the next line of defense. So let's say that this sneaky little pathogen got past all the physical barriers, got inside our, our body, um, and uh, managed to even escape the killer cell, got into the, the one of our body cells and is hiding in there, okay? Um, now what? We don't want that. So we can't break apart its membrane. We failed in that, but there's still one line of defense that we haven't used. And the last line is we're going to make this pathogen not be able to reproduce because, okay, so we have one. That's fine. It's inside our cell. Uh, ultimately, we'll get rid of it. 
but we don't want it to make multiples because once we hit multiples, then we actually get the disease. So what we do is we produce interferons, which are proteins that inhibit the reproduction of viruses, which is kind of other innate defense warriors. So killer cells, as we just discussed, patrol the entire body looking for surface abnormalities, cancerous, virus-infected scales, cells, and uh, secrete chemicals for necrosis. Necrosis means death of the cell. Please look at this link and come back to me. It is about a natural killer cell, and I'd like you to take a look at it. Although most defense mechanisms are to disrupt membranes, inhibiting reproduction of pathogens is the next defense. And how do we do that? Well, uh, we produce interferons, which are proteins that inhibit the reproduction of viruses. Then we have the inflammatory response. So histamines are um, molecules that signal for inflammation. These are stored in vesicles of mast cells in connective tissue and they cause the blood vessels that are close by to dilate. So the tissue swells up, a lot of water goes in, and along with the water, a lot of white blood cells. So the idea is to call the troops. Then uh, the inflammation also can um, include cytokines. Cytokines also promote blood flow to the affected region. These are chemicals, and these will also bring and this will, the Action will also bring in more phagocytes and mo more antimicrobial peptides. Then we have the complement system. There are about 30 proteins that circulate in the plasma in an act inactive state. Activation will only occur if they encounter the surface of a pathogen. If they bump into one, then a cascade of biochemical reactions will occur, and they all have lytic properties, which means they will break apart the cell membrane of the invader. The complement system is also involved in the inflammatory response. And here is a picture that I took from the book, and it shows you one phagocyte and um, with all the little feet, the feet are the pseudopodia that surrounding the pathogens, they surround the pathogens, they will um, engulf them. So here is the feet enclosing it. Here is it almost enclosed. And when it closes up, then you can see it becomes a vacuole um, with the bad guys in it, and then the vacuole will fuse with the lysosome, which happens to be hanging around the cell, and um, the lysosome will secrete lytic enzymes, which will just simply break apart the uh, membranes of, of these guys, and you get a whole bunch of junk, and this debris is then uh, sent out um, into the blood, and uh, it, it will result in other things happening. So that's phagocytosis. Here is a picture of the cell types of innate immunity. So if we look at the uh, uh, chart on the left-hand side and we work our way to the right-hand side, the first cell you see is the neutrophils, and we see their function written right here. They do phagocytosis, and uh, they um, produce reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. So these are free radicals, which disrupt membranes and they also produce antimicrobial peptides. Uh, the next guy is macrophage, and these also do phagocytosis. They have pseudopodia as well. Uh, they are inflammatory mediators. Um, they look for antigens, so they're looking for any antigen that's being presented on the surface of um, the uh, body cell. And they also produce um, free radicals like oxygen and nitrogen, which will disrupt the membrane of the invader, and they produce cytokines as well as complement proteins. Dendritic cells, so we hadn't talked about them um, until now, and uh, here we are. So they look also for the presentation of an antigen, which means uh, some um, bad guy has been ingested by one of our cells and is lurking under the surface and um, creating a bump. So the dendritic cells go around uh, looking for and those these bumpy cell uh, surfaces, um, just like macrophages. They also produce reactive oxygen species to uh, disrupt membranes. Um, they produce cytokines as well, but they also produce interferons, which is important. And then the natural killer cells, which are the last ones um, on all the way to the left, 
uh, uh, sorry, to the right, they um, are producing interferons, but what they also do is they go back and they tell the macrophages to get activated. Um, and they also uh, lyse viral infected cells. So here is um, the sequence of an inflammatory response. So in the first picture, what you see is a, a, a splinter. And it has a bunch of uh, bacteria, these red, uh, green things, long rod-like things. These are bacteria stuck to the splinter. Um, they're entering, piercing the skin. So the, these are the epithelial layers. <coughs> And um, as soon as they come in, um, underneath the skin is always, you know, a capillary, um, very thin, and um, uh, this will leak out plasma and other cells, except the red ones, and the uh, epithelial cells are bathed in all this stuff. So macrophages are lurking right behind, right underneath this skin surface. They're waiting for these guys to show up. And they're not disappointed. So here they are, the little green guys. Those are the bad bacteria. Um, and the macrophage is going to immediately send out these blue dots, which are signaling molecules. Um, and uh, mast cells will also send out signaling molecules saying, hey, uh, guys, somebody has shown up that we don't want in here. So let's go on to the next step, which is immediately, once they've sent out the signal for help, um, these guys, which are sitting around in inside the uh, red blood, uh, the um, capillaries, and they're not macrophages, they're neutrophils, they will say, aha, we've been called for help. So they will immediately squeeze out of the capillary right here and uh, go and just simply gulp up the bacteria. Um, and they will go because the movement of the fluid will make them move up. Um, and then what will happen is the destruction of, of the bacteria. They will all be engulfed, eaten up, um, battle has been waged, and uh, they will be gone. And then the tissue will ultimately heal. If it's a very small cut, you might not even get a scab. Uh, you might just have a little tiny pinprick, and uh, that will be the end of it. And then uh, we just go on. So uh, when, as we were discussing insects, we we're still discussing innate immunity. Um, so in an insect, when you have a disease and you're an insect, well, the defense is mounted against that piece of membrane of the bacteria or fungus that enters the organism. And that piece of membrane is made out of lipids and sugars and amino acids, and the immune system recognizes um, these bacteria and fung fungus by structures on their cell walls. Um, the innate immune responses are distinct for different classes of pathogens. They may be generic, but they're not all that generic. They're pretty distinct for different classes of pathogens. And let's look at that. So um, they actually have um, 15 different types that they will recognize, and, and they recognize them by something called a toll receptor. So the immune system cells of an insect will bind to unique macromolecules found in outer layers of bacteria and fungus. These macromolecules are identity tags for pathogen recognition. Recognition proteins, when bound to the invader cell wall, form a complex. And this complex activates the protein called TOL, which is a receptor on the surface of the hematocytes. The toll receptor will send a signal to the cell nucleus. The nucleus will send the signal back to the cell to synthesize antimicrobial proteins. Um, this process is called signal transduction. And these antimicrobial proteins will neutralize the foreign invaders. So, you know, so here we have a hematocyte sitting around. And, and here is this uh, bad invader showing up. Well, uh, the hematocyte will actually have a receptor right here waiting for it. As soon as it grabs it, it's going to send a signal to the nucleus, which is sitting right here. And the nucleus will send a signal right back saying, OK, let's produce some antimicrobial proteins, um, and uh, we will uh, help neutralize this, this threat. Here is um, a toll-like receptor signaling. Um, 
a pretty picture which shows you exactly what I did uh, in a very brief diagram. So here is the nucleus, remember double layer of the plasma membrane inside uh, uh, the nucleus is uh, the DNA and uh, here is a really bad guy showing up from uh, a bacteria, just a fragment of his his plasma membrane, a lipopolysaccharide, and it's going to attach to one of our one of the toll-like receptors, which will then um, send uh, responses to to the DNA, and the DNA will respond back, and that's called signal transduction. Pathogens entering the mammalian body are subject to phag phagocytosis, just like they are in uh, the insect. The phagocytic cells recognize groups of pathogens using toll-like receptors. They're not toll receptors because toll receptors are only present in insects. Um, in other animals, they're called toll-like because there's something like toll, -like, toll receptors. Pathogens are de detected by receptors similar to the toll receptors of insects. They're called toll-like receptors, and these pathogens are then phagocytosed. The toll-like receptors re recognize fragments of molecules characteristic of a set of pathogens. So here comes the specificity. Toll-like receptors are a class of proteins that play a key role in the innate immune system. Remember, we're still doing the innate. Um, and this is generic, this is for every organism that's multicellular. Um, Toll-like -like receptors are usually expressed in sentinel cells, such as macrophages, that recognize structurally conserved molecules derived from microbes. So what is a sentinel cell? A sentinel, as you know, is, is a guard or a sentry uh, who is um, standing outside a wall and doesn't want the wall to be breached. So he stands outside the wall and he walks up back and forth in front of the door, um, not too far from the door and uh, pretty close uh, to the wall so that nobody can sneak by him. Um, so uh, these sentinel cells are the ones that go around checking um, all our body cells to see uh, are these markers ourselves or not. And um, so they are the ones that have the toll-like receptors. Um, they're present in vertebrates. Uh, some invertebrates actually do have them, believe it or not. And they're represented in bacteria and in plants. And they appear to be one of the most ancient and conserved components of the immune system. Toll-like receptors activate immune cell responses. They're a type of pattern, so pattern, recognition, receptor, so that's why they're called PRRs for short, and they recognize molecules called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. Um, so they um, are receptors that recognize a pattern, a particular pattern that's broadly shared by pathogens. Um, there are three subgroups of toll-like receptors. Proteins with subgroup 1 toll-like receptor domains are receptors for interleukins that are produced by macrophages, monocytes, and dendritic cells. Proteins with subgroup 2 toll-like receptor domains are classical toll-like receptors and uh, bind directly or indirectly to the molecules of microbial origin. Proteins with subgroup 3 toll-like receptor domains are exclusively cytosolic and mediate, mediate signaling from proteins of subgroup 1 and 2. Most mammals have between 1 to 15 types of toll-like receptors. Not all toll-like receptors present in mammals are in humans, and neither are all human toll-like receptors in all mammals. Non-mammalian species have dis their own distinct toll-like receptors. We do know that toll-like receptor 10, um, there's something wrong with it. Uh, the, its function is unknown. The gene coding for it appears to have been damaged at some point in the past by a retrovirus and um, never corrected and never eliminated. So we just keep on copying it even though it's it, it doesn't work. So it's always there. Um, all toll-like receptors recognize proteins that are absent in the organism. So they recognize something that is not self. They recognize that these are our self proteins and these are not the self proteins that are, I'm seeing. So I need to get rid of this. 
And so toll-like receptor 3, for instance, recognizes double-stranded RNA, which is formed by viruses. And toll-like receptor 4, for instance, recognizes poly li lipopolysaccharides, which is a component of bacterial cell walls. Toll-like receptor 5 recognizes flagellin, uh, which is uh, the tail of a bacteria. So there are many different toll-like receptors, and they're generically ge uh, grouped according to what they recognize what broad categories of pathogens they recognize. So the toll-like receptors found in mammals are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Um, and what do they do? So notice that uh, six of these 15 receptor, 13 receptors um, are reserved just to recognize the patterns of bacteria. So toll-like receptor 1, 2, 3, 5, 9, and 13 are reserved only for bacteria. All they do is recognize bacterial patterns and then they try to neutralize that threat. Um, Toll-like receptor 3 is kind of unusual because it also can recognize viruses. Um, and if you remember, uh, it, it recognizes the double-stranded DNA. So um, uh, Toll-like receptor 9 and 7 and 13 um, they also recognize viruses. And notice it's 9 and 13 are the same, so is 3. So viruses, therefore, only have this one, which is unique. Um, the others kind of do double duty. And toll-like receptor 4 recognizes the host. Toll-like receptor 6 re recognizes mycoplasma, which are nasty bugs. And toll-like receptor 8 recognizes single-stranded RNA viruses. And here are where they sit. So um, here is a cell membrane represented by a large rectangle in yellow. And um, notice all the receptors perched on its membrane. Uh, one, two, four, five, and six. They're all perched there. Um, part of them is, is stuck into the membrane and hanging down. And the other part is the active part, which is going to neutralize the pathogen. It's waiting for someone to show up because they know it's coming. Um, so uh, bacterial parasites, gram-positive bacteria, fungi, gram-negative bacteria, flagellated bacteria, all these guys are going to be stopped at the membrane. So they won't make it in. Um, what will make it in are viruses, usually, because they're so small that they manage to make it in. But inside, uh, there is a second layer of defense. Um, and these are um, internal compartments. They could be um, some um, endoplasmic reticulum or some other um, compartments around, maybe the nuclear membrane. And so they will be the toll-like receptors 3, which recognizes uh, viral double-stranded RNA, um, uh, toll-like receptors 7, which recognizes single-stranded RNA, and then um, toll-like receptor 8, which recognizes single-stranded RNA, and then toll-like receptor 9, which recognizes bacterial DNA elements. So uh, here is a table which shows you um, the toll-like receptors that are specific for different patterns or different classes of microbial products. Um, so it shows you from 1 to 11, and uh, what do they do? So if you just uh, uh, go down to toll-like receptor 9, um, we do know that it looks like it looks for bacterial DNA. We just saw that in the previous slide. But notice it also looks for herpes infections. So some herpes viruses are actually uh, neutralized by toll-like receptor 9, which is very nice. Here is another little cartoon. Um, it shows you the... Um, um, uh, toll-like receptors over here and uh, trying to get rid of the pathogen uh, and uh, uh, what you see is uh, um, the cell going, oh no! Um, please look at these two links and come back to me. The first one uh, is actually a cartoon version and the second one, I know it is, it is a 10-minute explanation but believe me, it is worth it. I'm sorry I cannot click on it. Um, this software does not allow me to do that. But do click on these, uh, listen to them, watch them, and come back to me. So what triggers an innate immune response? In other words, how do phagocytes know what to eat? Well, bacterial cell walls components will activate phagocytes, and microbes contain 
PAMs, remember, the pathogen-associated molecular patterns, which are then recognized by pattern recognition receptors, which are on our toll-like receptors. So uh, here is a bacterial cell wall, and um, bacteria are pretty hardy because they have a plasma membrane, which is like ours, which is a phospholipid bilayer, and you can see that. Okay, so here is the phospholipid bilayer. Um, but but uh, the bacteria actually have several layers of bacteria of membranes, and in between they will actually have something called uh, peptidoglycan, which is uh, a sugar and a peptide, and um, they also have polysaccharides, as you can see over here, lipids and um, attached to uh, sugars. So um, these are distinctive for bacteria. And that is how the toll-like receptors manage to recognize them, because even if it's a tiny fragment, they will immediately know, aha, this is the pattern. Um, and so it will trigger the innate um, immune system. So now let's talk about the adaptive response. And this is kind of cool, because now uh, we're going into higher forms of life, which has a second backup response to deal with pathogens. And the adaptive response lies in the white blood cells called lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes can be two types, either a T cell or a B cell. Stem cells in the bone marrow will change into lymphocytes. The lymphocytes that migrate to the thymus gland become T cells, T for thymus. Lymphocytes that stay in the bone marrow become bone B cells or bone cells. So um, the B stands for bone marrow, T stands for thymus, and the lymphocytes that don't go either pla place, bone marrow or thymus, and just float around in the blood are known as the killer cells. So here's a little cartoon showing, uh, since there's so many choices to do, here is an older, wiser um, stem cell, and he's talking to a youngster stem cell, and they said, you know, when I was a little stem cell, I didn't know what to be either. And the little stem cell says, but I'm so confused. I don't know what to be. A natural killer cell? Or should I be a B cell? Or should I be a T cell? Anyway, um, the natural killer cell, now we did talk about it. Um, it is a, a cell that just goes around and kills. It does not wait. Um, its job is to be quick and efficient. So here is a cartoon. Now all it's going to do is going to look around for any bumps on our own cells. And if it sees a bump, it's just going to kill that cell because it knows that something is bad uh, in, in it um, and something is rotten inside. And so I'm just going to kill that cell so that the rest of the body can benefit. Um, so a bacterium-infected cell or a virus-infected cell or even a cancer cell is usually zapped by the killer T cells, um, they will just go around killing them because they don't, uh, they recognize they're wrong and so they'll kill them. This is what a T and a B cell looks like. So a B cell looks like this. This is awfully cool. And this is a T cell, okay? So the B cell looks more complex because it has these pretty receptors which are Y-shaped, whereas the T cell does not. So that's right off the bat one big difference. Um, let's look at the pretty B cells. Uh, so in the B cells, the Y-shaped receptor actually looks like this. It is uh, hooked into the plasma membrane. The heavy chain goes into the, plasma, the phospholipid bilayer and it's uh, hooked in there. And um, the heavy chain is made out of a constant region. So all B cells will have Y-shaped receptors with their tails. Um, the heavy chain's identical. And then they have a Y-shaped top. Um, in the Y-shaped top, there is a, an area called the variable region. And this is where the intense diversity occurs in uh, all the B cells. They can make any sort of region over here, so they're ready for any sort of receptor. Um, they do have a disulfide bridge or a covalent bond right here, which will hold the two um, chains together. But uh, other than that, uh, I, a B cell will have uh, a receptor that is Y-shaped, and it's uh, the antigen receptor. It's waiting for the bad guy to show up, to bind to it. Your T and B cells recognize invaders by the shape of molecules or the antigens on their surface. 
your immune system can produce a T and B cell to fit every possible imaginable shape. The sheer numbers of defense molecules is staggering. Um, our body makes 1 million different B cell antigen receptors and 10 million different T cell antigen receptors, so there is an enormous variety. Um, the reason for that is uh, there is the mathematical property of permutation or n factorial. And remember, uh, n factorial just means. Um, let's say if it's uh, 1 factorial, that just means 1 times 1. But if it's 2, factor if two factorial, that means 1 times 2. Um, if it is 4 factorial, then it's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. So uh, if we have many different variable regions um, and we keep on changing them, we can keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger numbers. So uh, here, this 4 factorial will, will result in 24 different types. Um, well, the um, variable regions are n times different. You can make n numbers of, of combinations. So that is an enormous amount of uh, diversity. Our own genome only has about 2.5 times um, 10 to the 4 genes, which will encode actually um, not quite that many billion different T cell receptors and the same number of different B cell receptors um, because the variable region will, will keep on varying. So look at this. Uh, you know, there's a, a three orders of magnitude that we can actually make different just from our um, small amount of genes, we can make tremendously huge numbers of uh, receptor molecules. Your body has up to 10 billion different B cells, making you ready to fight almost any invader. And um, those of you who need to do a little review on what uh, permutation and uh, um, factorials and, and uh, this combinatorics is. Um, let's just look at this rather quickly. Um, so let's say you have six six bells. This is a classical example. And they all have different tones. You know, maybe a little bell and then a slightly bigger bell and then uh, leading all the way to the great big grandma bell. Um, and when you toll the bells, you can toll them in, a, in any sort of um, variation that you want. You can make any melody. You can toll it, um, you, you can pull the bells, you can do one, 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 one. Uh, actually, you could do this forever. You could do twos forever. Um, you could do threes forever. You, you could uh, change it around. Um, you could do a set of ones, then you could do a set of twos. Or you could do um, a set of threes, or you could do one, three, one, or you could do one, two, one, three, or you, you know, so here you, you can do a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, and so you can see with just six, how many variations can you make? You can make an almost infinite number of variations. And um, the same example is, is uh, illustrated at the bottom. So you start out with one node, um, you can either go this way or that way. Um, then if you go this way, then you can go either this way or that way. And then if you go this way, then you can go either this way or that way. The same over here, um, you know, you could go, or you could go this way or that way, then you could do this or this, and then this or this. Uh, or there's just an infinite number of uh, ways you can approach this, um, and you can ch change the combinations um, almost in, in an infinite amount of time. So the variable regions of the T and B cells are the reason for the infinite diversity of antigen receptors. Antigen receptors are generated by random rearrangement of the DNA. Many different chains can be produced from the same gene by rearrangement of the DNA. Rearranged DNA is transcribed and then translated, and then the antigen receptor is formed. And here is a picture of it. So how do we rearrange the DNA? So here we see um, a B cell, which is undifferentiated, which means it's a baby B cell. It hasn't uh, been matured yet. And you can see various regions. So V37, V38, V39, and, and so on. And then here's the um, J's. And there's an intron. So the introns, of course, uh, they don't actually code for anything. Um, so here we are trying to train uh, this D B cell. And we're just going to um, say, well, let's see. We don't have to have all of these things. Um, we could just pick a few. 
And so it decides to pick 37, 38, 39, forget the 40, and then forget all the j's except j5. Well, the, then this becomes a completely different um, gene. And then when, when it's transcribed, um, and let's just forget all this part too. Um, and then we can just uh, have um, uh, the pre-messenger RNA have just these two things. And um, that will make it completely different from you know, the DNA that we started out with over here and the DNA that we differentiated into. And then finally we, we're trimming it and we're getting a completely different receptor. So here is uh, the uh, gene rearrangement continuing on. Um, remember a pre-messenger RNA has an intron. The intron has got to be cut out. And then you have to add a cap and a tail to the messenger RNA to make it a messenger RNA. So it can actually go into the ribosome and um, get translated. Um, and so you will get um, a, you know, a constant region, which will be always constant, and then a variable region, which could be anything. And this is how you will actually create um, your B cell antigen. So adaptive immunity can still recognize self from non-self, despite all these combinations of receptors, the N factorial combinations, as lymphocytes mature in bone marrow or the thymus, their antigen receptors are constantly tested for self-reactivity. So we do not want, by any accident, by rearrangement of the genes, um, to start, suddenly start destroying our own cells. Um, if that does happen, and it does, well, the faulty cells are destroyed by apoptosis, which is pro programmed cell death or cell suicide. And what is so special about your T cells? Well, um, we looked at the B cells and we said, okay, yeah, that, this is good. It's pretty. It's got these Y cell um, antigen receptors. Very nice. And then we saw the T cells and they didn't have the Y cell, uh, Y shape, but they did have a, um, a receptor. But what is so special about having two different types of cells? Why should we have T and Bs? Um, well, uh, they have different jobs. Once the invader is recognized, different types of T cells have different jobs to do. Some T cells will send chemical instructions called cytokines to the rest of the immune system. This is like saying, hey. Um, then your body can, will produce the most effective weapons against those invaders, which could be, um, you know, anybody could be invading you, bacteria or viruses or parasites. Other T cells will recognize and kill virus infected cells directly. Okay, some will just say, hey, um, and then the body will say, okay, got it, got the message. Um, and some will actually recognize and kill the virus infected cells directly. Some, and this is a third type, um, they will help B cells make antibodies which will circulate and bind to the antigens. So here is one type, two type, Three types. So what is so special about your B cells? Well, with the help of the T cells, B cells will make those special Y-shaped proteins called antibodies. They can't make them on their own. They need the T cell to help them do that. Antibodies stick to antigens on the surface of the pathogen, stopping them in their tracks, dead in their tracks, and creating clumps that alert your body to the presence of in intruders. So all of a sudden, there's like this big old pile and, um, and then the body says oh and this is not good then your body will start to make toxic substances to fight them patrolling defender cells called phagocytes will engulf and destroy antibody covered intruders so again what is an antigen it's any substance that will elicit a response from the t or b cells this is now in the adaptive immune system an antigen actually is any substance that will el elicit any immune response. But here we're talking about the antigens in the adaptive immune system, and they will response, elicit a response from either a T or a B cell. The antigen will bind to just one part of one antigen receptor. That part is known as the epitope. Remember the last time we were talking about receptors, we were saying major histocompatibility complex? Not anymore. Each T or B cell has about 100,000 antigen receptors on its surface. Each T or B cell is identical. All those receptors are the same, but each T or B cell is different from each other. 
So you'll have one T or B cell entirely covered with one type of antigen receptor. The next T or B cell will be completely different, but it will be entirely covered by that other antigen receptor. So that's the important thing to remember. Each individual B or T cell is specialized to recognize one specific type of molecule. Each B cell antigen is Y-shaped and has four polypeptide chains, two identical heavy chains, and two identical light chains connected by disulfide bridges. And we looked at pictures of those. The receptor is anchored in the plasma membrane by a transmembrane region near the end of each heavy chain. A short tail of each heavy chain extends into the cytoplasm. We saw a picture of that, and here it is again. Here are the light chains in yellow. Um, the disulfide bonds are right here, and then the heavy chains are in, in uh, green. Each B cell antigen has two identical antigen binding sites. The constant regions of the chains vary little among B cells, whereas the variable regions differ greatly. The variable regions provide antigen specificity. So those are the ones that are actually uh, tailored for every kind of bad guy that will show up. Here is uh, an anti a B cell. Here are the B, um, B cell antigen receptors. And when they bind to a pathogen, um, this entire thing is called, uh, this is called an epitope and you get a big complex. So the steps to neutralize the pathogen in the adaptive immune system. The two tips of the Y sh shape on both ends have variable regions specific to each B cell. The antigen receptor of the B cell will bind to the corresponding antigen of the pathogen and it will activate the B cell. Once activated, the B cell will form a complex with the pathogen. And then eventually a protein is secreted called an antibody antibody or immunoglobulin and these antibodies have the same y-shaped structure as the b-cell antigen receptors but instead of being membrane bound like the receptors they're secreted so they can float around these antibodies are the real agents that neutralize the pathogen so here's a little cartoon um, here is a, a fat old b-cell and he's got all these uh, b-cell receptors and as soon as he shakes them off of him they become antibodies that is identical to the receptors. They just uh, manage to float around in, in the uh, blood. What do antibodies do? Antibodies trap invading viruses or bacteria in large clumps. This makes it easy for macrophages to eat them. Antibody-coated viruses are neutralized because they can't infect your cells. Even after you've fought off your infection, some antibodies stay in your blood. Um, and if that virus tries to infect you again, your immune system has a head start trapping it because of this memory. We're going to look at the memory in a little bit more detail. So here is um, a picture. We looked at this part before. So uh, B cell receptor binding to an epitope of an antigen. Sounds great. Okay, next what happens is that the B cell receptor is going to secrete antibodies, which are free floating, and it will make a ton of copies of itself. Here it is making a ton of copies of itself. And then um, these particular antibodies will go around floating um, and neutralize uh, the pathogen which is hanging around. Um, and uh, so the threat is, is taken care of. Um, but do notice that these bonds that are made or the uh, um, receptors that stick to uh, the bad guys are very, very weak bonds. Um, so they're, uh, generally speaking, they're electrostatic forces, hydrogen bonds, we looked at these before, van der Waals forces, or hydrophobic forces. So they're very, very weak bonds. And the amount of energy that's involved is also really, really little. Um, so if you look at a covalent bond, uh, and that bond length would be about 0.5 nanometers, and the energy that is required to create one or that is stored in one is about 90 kilocals per mole. An ionic bond, which is depending on how strong it is, it could be more, it could be less. Um, the energy in the in such a bond would be just three. A hydrogen bond um, only has one kilocalorie, and look at the length; it's getting a little bit bigger, so the molecules are actually getting farther apart. And van der Waals and the molecules are again now getting farther apart. And now it has dropped down to only 0.1 kilocals per mole. So these these are very, very, um, very weak interactions, but they do the job. T 
T-cell and B-cell antigen receptors are functionally different. So that's one very important thing to remember. The antigen receptor in T-cells is made out of two polypeptide chains, an alpha chain and a beta chain, again linked by um, a disulfide bridge. The molecule is anchored in the cell's plasma membrane at the base, and the variable regions are on the outer tips of the molecule and form a single antigen binding site, and the rest is a constant site. So um, the T-cell antigen receptor looks almost like a B-cell receptor, except it's not Y-shaped. It still has the, the uh, um, chains embedded in the cytoplasm. Um, there's a difference. One is an alpha and one is a beta chain, and they're slightly different. They do have a constant region, and they do have that disulfide bridge, uh, and they have variable regions and on the top, which bind to um, the pathogen. Um, so. The major histocompatibility conflicts, which we talked about much earlier uh, today, uh, these are molecules um, that are host proteins that display the antigen fragments on the cell surface. And the antigen fragments bind to the host cell surface, and they're presented for display. So presented, how, what does that mean? Do you present it like a present? Actually, sort of like that. Um, and then a roving T cell will bind to this antigen fragment, and the pathogen is neutralized. So here is uh, um, uh, something I took from your book. So here is uh, the infected cell. It's going to present an antigen fragment like, um, I have a problem. Somebody come look at me. I'm, I've swallowed a bad guy. And so it shows this bump. And then the T cell floats around and says, aha, I see it. Um, and it will bind to it and um, um, it will recognize it. And if you actually look at it, uh, not, not sideways as in here, but from the top view, um, this is what would, you would actually see. It's actually enclosed, so um, it's neutralized. The B cell antigen receptors bind to epitopes of intact antigens floating in the blood. Uh, the T cell antigens bind to fragments of antigens presented on host cells. So that's the difference between the T and B cells. Please do look at this awesome link. Um, it is beautiful. It has cartoons uh, of uh, the, all the, the uh, immune system guys, uh, and it shows you the bad guy jumping in, uh, destroy, trying to destroy your cell, getting blown to pieces. So please take a look at it and then come back to me. So the viral attack story, let's talk about it. It's worth going over again because uh, this is very important to know how do we deal with uh, such crises. Unlike T, and T cells and macrophage cells, B cells do not can kill the viruses themselves. In the viral attack story, the B cell actually just sweeps up the leftover viruses after the T cell attack. Actually, B cells are just as important as T cells and are much more than just a few, the final cleanup crew. They make important molecules called antibodies, and these molecules trap specific invading viruses and bacteria. Without this line of defense, your body would not be able to finish fighting most infections. So B cells are very important. When a B cell receptor connects to its specific antigen, something strange happens. A helper T cell releases chemicals that tell the B cell to divide many times. This makes an army of B cells with the perfectly shaped B cell receptor to connect to the invader in your body. Many of these B cells, um, this huge army, will turn into plasma cells. And plasma cells make and release antibodies that connect to the same antigen as the original B cell receptor. Plasma cells make thousands of antibodies per second, which spread throughout your body, trapping any viruses they see along the way. So this is rapid. Um, here is a, a cartoon showing you what happens to a B cell. So here is the good old B cell. It finds this horrible little antigen. Uh, it will bind to it. And then um, it will say, mm. um, and then um, there will be um, a helper T cell, which isn't shown actually in this, in this version which will tell uh, the activate the B cell and say, okay, make more of yourself. So it will. It will make a whole army of it. And, um, and these ant plasma cells will then produce antibodies, which will go and neutralize the pathogen. 
and then a small fraction of the army will become memory cells. And those memory cells will stay in your blood forever. Uh, and remember, if that pathogen shows up again, uh, then they don't have to make the variable region from scratch. It's already there, so work is done. T cell, B cell, what's the difference? Okay, let's talk about it. Just like T cells, each B cell has a receptor that will connect, connect to only one antigen shape. Only one. An important difference between T cells and B cells is that B cells can connect to antigens right on the surface of the invading virus or bacteria. This is different from T cells, which can only connect to the virus antigens on the outside of the infected cells. So here is a cartoon showing that. Uh, B cells say, I attack invaders outside the cells. T cells says, I in fact attack invaders inside the cells. Um, the adaptive immune system has four major characteristics. One is, there is the immense diversity of lymphocytes and receptors. Two is self-tolerance, um, the ability to recognize self and not react against your own self. Third, there's B and T cells, which proliferate after, after activation. And fourth, which is the immune, immunological memory, which we keep um, so that the second time we get infected by that same pathogen, um, sometimes we don't even notice it or we get infected uh, and we just feel maybe a little bit sick, but not full-blown sick. Uh, do look at this link. Uh, it is a, a musical song, a way of expressing the immune system um, in a rhythmic beat. Um, check it out, enjoy it, and then come back to me. So adaptive immunity, wrapping it up, it means there's a huge diversity of both lymphocytes and receptors. So pathogens that have never ever been seen by the body can be detected. There is a recognition of self, that is, there's self-tolerance. Despite having a huge diversity, it can, the, the ability to recognize one cell, uh, which is our own, um, is still retained. Pathogens will trigger a huge population of T and B cells, and then there's the immunological memory, which means that the response is rapid and uh, much faster, much stronger, if that pathogen has been encountered before. Um, here is a nice picture showing you um, the macrophage and dendritic cells serving as antigen-presenting cells for adap the adaptive immune cells, which would be the T cells. So here is a, on the left, what you see is an actual electron micrograph, um, which shows you the uh, T cell present, uh, interacting with a macrophage, uh, which is an antigen presenting cell. Um, and on uh, the right side, you see it in cartoon version. Um, so here is uh, our virus infected cell. So he's got all these little um, flags sticking out, uh, which say help, help. Um, so his surface is uh, bumpy. So roving T cell will actually come around and say, I see you, and it will uh, attach to it. And, um, and then it will, uh, there will be uh, other responses. Um, here is an antigen, that's a virus infected cell. Um, here is an antigen presenting cell, so uh, these would be uh, still making complexes and still doing their job, um, which is to neutralize the pathogen, um, which this will involve uh, signaling from the toll-like receptors. Um, they will activate the innu innate immune, response, in immune cells like the macrophages and dendritic cells. And then the innate immune cells that have been activated by the toll-like receptor signaling are much more effective antigen-presenting cells than resting immune cells. Um, and uh, the adaptive immune system will kick in when the in innate immune signaling is insufficient to clear the pathogen. Here is toll-like receptor signaling within phagosomes, um, which determines the fate of that phagosome. So again, what is a phagosome? Well, that would be a, a, a vacuole um, that is um, inside a cell that has stuff in it. Um, so whatever the signaling is within that phagosome, that will determine the fate of the cell should we um, destroy the cell and undergo 
um, uh, death? Or should we present the antigen to the surface and let somebody help us? So if you look at the left-hand side, here is um, toll-like receptor signaling, and uh, the pathogen has uh, is inside of the phagosome in a star shape, and um, it will enter the antigen present presentation pathway, which will be to present to T cells. Um, so it will um, stick out like a little bump, and the T cell will come and help neutralize it. However, if the antigen is such, uh, if uh, the the um, bad guy that has been engulfed is such that the cell recognizes this is not good uh, stuff um, and maybe I can just take care of it. So um, the material is going to be disposed inside of the cell so there is no need to present it to roving T cells uh, or if uh, the cell uh, is overwhelmed by that um, antigen um, it will signal it to its own self and it will kill its own self and there will be no toad like receptor signaling either way. So um, when the cell decides that I can't, I'm overwhelmed with this pathogen and I need to um, kill my own self, that would be cellular suicide and there's a name for it and it's called apoptosis. Apoptosis is a very uh, neat and good way of disposing of uh, the the um, threat, even though it means sacrificing one of your own cells, because it is uh, energy efficient and it is uh, neat and tidy. Uh, the cell will self-destruct inwards and um, it will create some enzymes which will break apart the proteins and uh, it will become little blebs and these remnants will then be eaten up by phagocytosis and everything is cleared out. So it's sort of like uh, when um, uh, buildings are broken down, um, they usually collapse inwards. And this is how cell suicide is. And so there's not a lot of uh, uh, debris or um, uh, insult to the neighbors. So if we look at the differences between apoptosis and necrosis, apoptosis is very tidy. The contents of the cells are degraded from within, producing small blebs. It is programmed from inside the cell. Whereas necrosis is very messy, the contents of the cell are suddenly released, and this is induced by ex external insult. Uh, here is another picture uh, which will show you the two pathways that the cell can choose to take. Um, cell death by necrosis is more likely to produce inflammation because uh, this is sudden, it is not expected. Um, and all the contents of the cell are going to go flying out and then uh, a lot of inflammation will have to ha happen so that all the contents can be captured um, and eaten. Whereas apoptosis is um, a very neat uh, and uh, fragmented compartmentalization of the cell uh, and those little fragments are then eaten up by phagocytes that are roving around and so uh, there's uh, nary a ruffle um, and nobody knows that this went on. It's just normal business. Here is a dendritic cell. I did say that we should go back to slide 17 and look at it. Um, here is a resting dendritic cell. It's activated by cells dying of necrosis, but it is not activated by cells dying of apoptosis. So uh, necrotic cells, um, they will generally send signals um, usually it's heat shock protein GP96 and heat shock protein 70 that will activate a dendritic cell. And also uric acid will then uh, also ac activate a dendritic cell. So these are uh, extreme signals that will um, get the dendritic cell to get a move on. Here is a comparison of the adaptive and the innate res immune responses. So on the left-hand side, uh, it's all innate, and uh, you can see that the response time is within hours, whereas in the adaptive, the response time is within days. Um, in innate, the response to re repeat infection is identical. There's no memory, whereas in adaptive, the response to repeat infection is a much stronger response, much faster, because there is a memory. Um, in the innate, the receptors that mediate pathogen recognition are toll-like receptors. They are PRRs, and there are not that many of them. So there's just uh, 15 or 13 or 12 or some number that's um, around 10. 
whereas in the adaptive immune response, the receptors that mediate pathogen re recognition, there, it's an unlimited diversity. There are antibodies and there are T cell antigen receptors. There's, there's, the diversity is unlimited. And then the ligands, um, these are the PAMPs, so the pathogen associated molecular patterns um, that uh, is present in innate response. Um, that, but in um, the adaptive immune system, you don't have to have just one tiny pattern. Um, you could have just a tiny fragment or any part of a pathogen and the T or B cell will recognize it instantaneously that this is not me. Uh, whereas um, in the innate immune system, you actually have to have you know, a big enough fragment so that you can recognize the pattern. It has to read the pattern to see if it's like your, cell, your own body cell or not. Um, but the T and B cells have no difficulty recognizing just uh, maybe it's just a teensy fragment or um, two molecules. So um, humoral and cell-mediated response, we looked at that very early on, and uh, it's uh, slightly different. Um, so let's look at it. Uh, immunological memory is responsible for long-term protections against diseases. In the humoral immune response, antibodies help neutralize or eliminate toxins and pathogens in the blood and the lymph. Okay, so that would be just in the stuff that's floating around. In the cell-mediated response uh, for the immune system, there's specialized cells called T cells that destroy affected host cells. Um, so let's look at the helper T cells because we didn't we mentioned it and then we ran away. We didn't go into it. And the helper T cells are actually really cool. There's a type of T cell called a helper T cell, and that triggers both the humoral and the cell-mediated immune responses. Signals from helper T cells initiate production of antibodies that neutralize pathogens and activate T cells that kill infected cells. Antigen presenting cells have class 1 and class 2 major histocompatibility complex molecules on their surfaces. Here is a cartoon. Here's an antigen presenting cell, and <laughs> it looks like a phagocyte, and then it's got the antigen all grabbed up, and the antigen does not look happy because he's captured. And then here is the uh, big old uh, bouncer-looking helper T cell with, the, notice, the Y-shaped antigen <laughs> receptors um, on its head, and it looks like uh, he, he's uh, going to... Um, uh, take care of the antigen pretty well. So um, continuing on with the helper T cells, the class two major histocompatibility complex molecules are the basis upon which antigen presenting cells are recognized. Antigen receptors on the surface of the helper T cells bind to the antigen and the class two major histocompatibility histocompa molecule. Then signals are exchanged between the two cells and then the helper T cell is activated it proliferates, and it forms a clone of helper T cells, which then activate the appropriate B cells. So it's a whole sequence. So here is a helper T cell, okay? And um, it's uh, um, we're going to look at it. So here is a first of all, there's an antigen presentation. How do you present that? Oh, well, the dendritic cell or the phagocyte has to eat the bacteria, and then it's presenting it. You know, you can see little. Uh, it's like um, after you eat a popsicle, your tongue becomes yellow. So you can actually see that there are remnants of the bacteria that go to the surface of the phagocyte. Well, the phagocyte will present this antigen to a helper T cell who's hanging around and says, uh, hangs on to it, and then he gets activated. Um, so once he's activated, and uh, notice how he's all alarmed, um, he will start a whole sequence of events. So the activation of B cells involves helper T cells as well as proteins on the surface of pathogens. When an antigen binds a B cell, the cell takes in a few foreign molecules by receptor-mediated endocytosis. The class II major histocompatibility protein of the B cell then presents an antigen fragment to the helper T cell, a process that is critical to B cell activation. This has to happen before anything else happens. So here is a helper T cell. Um, on the right, it's this round orange blob. And there's a macrophage. Um, and uh, the helper T cell will read and recognize the antigens, which are these things sticking out of the macrophage. Um, and it's saying, aha. 
So an activated B cell will give rise to thousands of identical cells. These bring in producing and secreting antibodies. Most antigens recognized by B cells contain multiple epitopes. A variety of B cells activated by one antigen will give rise to cells producing antibodies directed against different epitopes of the common antigen. So this is the second in the sequence. Um, so here is the ma macrophage presenting all those uh, nasty things. Um, the T cell says, aha, and then he says, hey, yo. Um, and he calls on a B cell and says, can you come and help? Um, so it will trigger an immune response. It will send out messages to go get the B cells to help out. Here is a, a, a more formalized cartoon version, um, which is from your book. It shows the central low role of helper T cells in humoral and cell-mediated res immune responses. And so here, what we see is um, um, the white blood cell, yeah, and uh, it has taken up the pathogen, and it has actually uh, already got antigen fragments, and it's presenting uh, its antigen. Um, a helper T cell comes around and says, "I see the fragment." Uh, I will bind to it. Immediately it gets activated and it starts secreting cytokines which will uh, have a positive feedback effect and um, act on uh, the uh, uh, cells. And then um, in the B cell, um, in the humoral immunity, what will happen is um, this helper T cell will actually get very activated um, and it will um, tell the B cells to secrete antibodies. Um, however, if the cell is beyond help, then uh, the, um, this cell, if it's, he's beyond help, then um, the uh, helper T cell will create some cytotoxic T cells, which will then go and kill the entire cell. All right. Um, do go look at this link. It's only 30 seconds and come back to me. Here is uh, the whole viral attack story. Um, told in a complete cartoon. So um, here is uh, a helper T cell, and she says, hi, B cell, and notice all these bad guys running around. And so these are the foreign pathogens. Um, and uh, the B cell says, uh, what a mess. Let's get these viruses all cleaned up. And he swishes all these viruses into his bucket, and he looks around. He says, I don't think I see any more. looks like the last of them are gone. The body should be feeling much better. And now I'm going to go and alert the other B cells to this virus. And he puts up a poster uh, so that the memory is there. All the B cells that will see uh, this particular poster will become B memory cells. And they'll be able to recognize this virus if it ever comes back. So that's, in short, what happens. Um, so here is the activation of a B cell in the humoral immune response. Uh, again, this is slide by slide, so uh, the antigen presenting cell will make a major histocompatibility complex. Uh, cytokines are then secreted, and then a whole bunch of things happens. And you should definitely click on this link and look at this. Um, uh, this, <laughs> this is actually a really funny, uh, funny video. Um, showing you that uh, we may be professors and fuddy-duddies, but uh, we do try to try to get this um, concept across to you, whatever the concept may be, even if it makes us look silly. So um, please look at the link and then come back to me. Cytotoxic T cells use toxic proteins to kill cells infected by viruses or other intracellular proteins. Uh, intracellular pathogens. Cytotoxic toxic T cells recognize fragments of foreign proteins produced by infected cells. And the activated cytotoxic T cell secretes proteins that disrupt the membranes of target cells and trigger their apoptosis. So here is the killing action of the cytotoxic T cell on an infected host cell. So this cell is now, it's just too far gone. Look at it. It's got all these antigen fragments, and it just isn't going to work at all. Um, and so what will happen is the cytotoxic T cell will actually produce these, um, these uh, molecules, which will produce holes on this cell. Um, they're called, uh, these chem chemicals are called perforin, so they make perforations in the cell membrane, and that will lead to 
um, apoptosis of this cell. Um, and so the cytotoxic T cell has got to go. It's sad. Uh, somebody's got to die. Can't make an omelet without breaking a lot of eggs. And this is what happens when you are in a fight. So uh, we just make more. The antibodies actually do not kill pathogens. And so this is something that I didn't mention before. I didn't stress it before. I did mention that they neutralize the pathogen. I didn't say exactly what happens or what does neutralization actually mean. It doesn't mean they kill them. It just means that they mark them for destruction. So in neutralization, antibodies will bind to viral surface proteins, preventing the infection of a host cell. So then that virus is bound and it can't go and enter another cell. It's just stuck, uh, floating around, can't do anything, and it's just bound up. Antibodies may also bind to toxins in body fluids and prevent them from entering body cells. In oxonization, antibodies will bind to antigens on bacteria, triggering phagocytosis. Opsonin coating makes them more delicious to killer cells than to phagocytes. So uh, any um, antigen that is coated uh, with uh, uh, opsonin will make the, uh, uh, the, the killer cells think this is yummy food and they will come and eat it faster. Antigen-antibody complexes may bind to a complement protein, which will trigger a cascade of complement protein activation. We talked about this earlier. Ultimately, a membrane attack complex forms a pore in this membrane of the foreign cell, leading to its lysis. Um, so the mechanisms of antigen disposal. So now that we got the antigen, how do we get rid of it? We've got to dispose of it. So um, there are many ways you can do neutralization, all right? Um, so here's this virus floating around, can't do anything, can't enter a cell because all the antibodies are attached to it. So it can't land. Um, you can coat your bacteria with opsonin, and in that case, the, the macrophage will say, oh, yummy, and it will eat it. And so you can do opsonization. Or um, you can activate the complement system, and the complement system will actually create pores. And so it will secrete these um, these chemicals, which will uh, create pores in the membrane of uh, the bad guy's cell, not your own, your the bad guy's cell, which is roaming around, and it will um, this pore will actually allow water to enter in, and ultimately this um, foreign cell is just going to pop because it'll have too much water inside. So here is a summary of the B cell. Um, so here is a B cell. It finds an antigen which matches its receptor, and so it's going to bind to it. And so it's saying this one first. Uh, the minute that happens, it gets activated. And um, at the helper T cell, uh, once it's activated, then the helper T cell will, will start to tell it, OK, do something. Um, then the B cell will divide into plasma cells, which will produce plasma, and memory cells. The plasma cells will actually go and produce antibodies, um, which will attach to the current type of invader. And then their phagocytes running around, um, they will have, uh, uh, they prefer the intruders marked with antibodies or opsonin, and they will just go and eat them because that's what they do. Um, and then the memory cells, which are these, and these guys will actually remember uh, that same intruder and uh, help activate the immune system much faster and to, so that the next time you get that same infection, it is uh, taken care of much faster. Please do click on this link at the bottom. Um, it is very helpful and useful and come back to me. Here is an overview of the adaptive immune response. And uh, what we see over here is um, um, so on the left-hand side, it's color-coded blue. On the right-hand side, it's color-coded green. And that is because green is for the T cells and B is for B cells. So uh, we have an antigen, and uh, you get your first exposure. You're going to be engulfed. Generally speaking, you're just going to be eaten up. Uh, and um, uh, then your the cells that have eaten you will actually be presenting you to um, the environment. And uh, the helper T cell will see that. And then um, the helper T cell will bind to that cell. 
and then it will tell uh, do two things it will go to B cells and cytotoxic C cells um, once it goes to B cells B cells will make plasma cells and memory cells and plasma cells will make antibodies which will go attached to the pathogens um, and uh, the cytotoxic T cells will actually go and make um, cytotoxic toxic T cells and um, they will defend against the pathogens and other cancers. The memory cells will help at the second exposure and so you don't have to go through this top part anymore and you just go through the cycle much faster. Um, here is uh, the entire cartoon. It is taken from the University of Arizona and they have a very nice uh, uh, cartoon on this viral attack story and I thought I'd bring the whole thing up to you so you could actually look at it. So um, our story begins with a sore throat, the kind that's red and hurts to swallow. The cause is an attack by a single virus that has become an invading army. Left alone, they would take over and destroy every living cell. It's these nasty looking red guys. It is up to some key defense systems to battle and defeat these forces. So M for macrophage, um, this is the T cell, the helper cell, this is B cell, and that's the killer cell. Let's see how these specialized system cells, known as the immune system, work together to return our bodies to working order. Inside our throat and body are cells called epithelial cells. So these are the epithelial cells. This epithelia is nice and happy, but not for long. And you see the uh, nasty virus saying he he he, and he attacks the epithelial cell, who is taken by surprise. At first, the virus is just inside a few cells in the throat, not causing too much harm. The body doesn't even notice. Um, this epithelial cell is saying, hey, you're just one itsy bitsy virus. This isn't so bad. But the problem with viruses is they multiply two days later. Um, the epithelial cells are overwhelmed and uh, it's saying, oh, I don't feel so good. I'm going to need some help. So it goes and runs and presses the alarm. Um, and the alarm um, is uh, activated um, and uh, the sound is sent, the, the signal is sent out to say help. But it's too late uh, for the epithelial cell and it goes kablooey. And um, all the viruses are, there are so many inside, they now have exploded out and there's a big mess uh, of the loose viruses. And so um, if they don't clean them up right away, the other epithelial cells will be in terrible danger. And so the macrophages come around and he heard the alarm and he says, I'm the first member of the body's immune system to clean up crew. And so it starts cleaning up all those uh, viruses, but there are too many. And he says, I, it's more than I can clean up by myself. So uh, if we don't do something quickly, these leftover viruses will attack other epithelial cells. And the macrophage says, it's time to call for backup. And it calls the T cells. And here we go. Um, suddenly, uh, there's uh, this response. Um, these helper cells show up. There's the killer cell, and that is a helper T cell, and um, they ask for what is the problem. Um, the helper T cell says, looks like we're too late for this one. He has too many viruses inside already. Killer T, you'll, you'll have to destroy the cell. It's the only way to stop more viruses from being released. And Killer T takes out his big ray gun and says, okay, viruses meet my cytotoxin gun. And he aims and he shoots. Um, and blam, and then uh, the viruses all uh, die. Um, and uh, the uh, killer T cell is told, good job. Um, and he says, well, there's still some viruses around. And the helper T cell says, well, I'll just call for backup, no problem. And she calls B cells, we need your help. Um, and so all of a sudden, the B cells show up and uh, they, they, take, they clean up and then the next day um, the person feels well. So for our immune system, what are the good things and what are the bad things? How can we help it? Moderate exercise will improve our immune system function. So moderate exercise is always good. Um, decreasing psychological stress is always good because psychological stress has been shown to disrupt the immune system regulation by altering interactions of the hormonal, nervous, and immune systems. They all interact together, and if you have stress, then they don't interact quite the right way. 
Um, sufficient rest is also important for immunity. So please do get enough rest, some exercise, and uh, try to decrease on the stress. Please look at these next two links. Uh, these are, I would like to wrap this, this uh, uh, lecture up on the immune system by sending you to these two links. The first link is uh, by Bozeman. It's a really good one. And the second one is uh, by the Khan Academy, also on the immune system, and also a really good one. All right, students, I hope this was helpful. I'll see you next time.